So let us start with the peace chant. Om Bhadram Karne Bhe Shrinuyama Deva Bhadram Pashe Maksha Bhirya Jatra Stirai Rangai Sushtavagam Sastano Bhihi Vyashema Deva Hitain Yadayuhu Swastina Indro Vridhashrava Swastina Pusha Vishwaveda Swastina Starksho Arishta Nemihi Swastino Brihaspatir Dadhatu Om Shanti 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 Over the last few classes, we have seen the analysis of the self and what a grand vision it has revealed. What are we? What is our nature? The Upanishad says there are four aspects to our nature, to, to what we are. The first aspect is the waking. So this entire world which we experience, and I the experiencer, all of this, all the people, all the creatures, all the events, whatever is going on, part of my waking world, the physical universe, all this is one aspect of yourself, the first one. And the second one, dreaming, and it's not just dreams, it's the level of the mind. At the level of the mind, there's a subtle universe, thoughts, feelings, emotions, ideas, knowledge, all of that together, not only in one mind, in all minds, all together, that is the second aspect of the self. That is your second aspect. And all of this, the physical universe which we experience and the mental universe which we experience, all of it disappears into a darkness, a potential form in deep sleep. That is our third aspect. And all of these three, notice, they come and go. They are subject to change. There is happiness and misery. Most of it is misery. But it all comes and goes. It changes. And it all appears and disappears in you, the consciousness, which is the fourth. The pure consciousness, Turiya, is the fourth aspect. And that's the real aspect. That's the reality which appears to us as waking, dreaming, deep sleep. What is this waking, dreaming, deep sleep? Remember the story of God pretending to be not God? So here is you, God, pretending to be not God, waking, dreaming, deep sleep. And this is how you engage yourself. This is the grand vision of the self, of what we are. So analysis of the self. But you will remember the Upanishad promised one more thing. And that is an analysis of Om. Om, so two things were promised at the very beginning. That there are two things we are going to do. One was an inquiry into the self to realize what we are. Another was an inquiry into Om. So that inquiry into Om we will look at briefly this morning. Why is that proposed? It's as a support. Whatever has been said, that's central. The inquiry into Om is as a support, as, an, as a help to what we have discussed so far. This inquiry into Om it can be understood at different levels. Um, there is a primary level and there's a deeper level and even deeper level, three levels of understanding, which we will quickly look at today. But to understand, so it says that Om is Brahman, Om itself, if you remember the first mantra we read, um, whatever is in time, past, present and future, all of it is Om. And whatever is beyond time, Brahman, that too is Om. How do we understand this? How can this little um, sound, this little mantra, Om, be everything in this universe? Everything that we experience and everything that is transcendent, all of it is Om. How? It's time for a story. <laughs> and it's a very nice story. It's a Ganesha story. I remember when I first came to America about five years ago, I was surprised to find how popular Ganesha is. I thought he would be the least uh, likely to be popular among the Hindu gods because he's an elephant head and a big tummy and he's short. Uh, 
But I asked, why is Ganesha? Everybody knows about Ganesha. I went to a school to talk about Hinduism, and then after that, in a Q&A session, um, I said, any questions? And the students, who were all, none of them were Indians, uh, one of them asked, the first question was, what is Ganesha? So <laughs> it's uh, something very um, well-known. I asked an American, why is Ganesha popular? And he said, who doesn't love a, an elephant? Who doesn't love an elephant? <laughs> So the story is this. The great god Shiva, who is the father of Ganesha, the great god Shiva and um, Parvati, who is the mother of Ganesha. So Shiva and Parvati were in their abode in Kailasha, in the Mount Kailasha. And the story goes, so Ganesha, and Ganesha is a brother, Kartika. Kartika is the lord of war. He's a great warrior. He's a god too. Now one day, their mother, the divine mother Parvati, she called the two sons and said, uh, hey, how about having some fun? You know, this, uh, in two different versions of the story, I've heard this mango or this, this diamond necklace. Mango is more fun. Um, I'll give this to you. But this is going to be a race between the two of you. The one who wins the race gets the mango. Okay, what kind of race is it? Remember, they are gods. So she, she said, the one who goes around the universe three times first and comes back here first, that one gets the mango. Kartika, of course, was very confident. He looked at his brother, and his brother is, is short and, and fat. This fat kid, he can hardly move around, and he's a bit of a couch potato, you know, he likes relaxing. And Kartika is fit. He's quite, quite the divine athlete, and he's a warrior. Not only that, all of the gods have their own vehicles. They are different animals. So Durga has the lion as the vehicle, and Shiva has the bull. And uh, uh, so Kartika has a peacock, uh, and very symbolic. <laughs> Kartika is a bit of a peacock himself, so a peacock as, uh, as his mount. Whereas Ganesha, poor Ganesha, is only a mouse. And so Kartika thought, he is fat, my brother. And he, his mount is only a mouse, which can hardly move around, crawl around. And if Ganesha is sitting on the poor mouse, that's it. He's not going very far. Whereas I have the peacock. Now, I don't think a peacock can fly too well, let alone around the universe. But anyway, it's a story. So, so I have the peacock, and I can easily fly around the universe. Let's go. And immediately hops on his peacock. He says, he just thinks the mango is already mine. And he flies off to go around the universe three times. And Parvati looks at Ganesha, who's still relaxing, and says, my dear, aren't you going to try? And Ganesha is like, if you insist. And he gets up, folds his hands, and he goes around Shiva and Parvati three times. And he says, to me, you, my mother, and you, my father, are my universe. So, and he bows down to them. And she is so pleased, she gives him the <laughs> mango. You can Im only imagine the fury of <laughs> Kartika who comes back after circling the universe three times. But what it means, it's a deep, very profound truth. That there is a reality which appears as this entire universe. Just as if you understood what gold is, you have understood all ornaments. All the ornaments made out of that gold, you don't know what kind of ornament it will be, um, what design it will be, that's all up to Maya. But that it is made of gold, that nobody needs to tell you. Any kind of ornament made from that gold, you know one thing, that it is nothing but gold. That's right. So in the same way, Ganesha knows this entire universe is nothing but Shiva Parvati. It's the play of the absolute and Maya this entire universe. So he knows it in truth. What Kartika is desperately circling is an appearance. What's the meaning of the story? Om is the entirety of reality. It is reality in, an, in the essence. That's why Om is so important. Om is very important in Indian culture. It's of course the most important mantra in all of Hinduism. All mantras, when you use uh, mantras in Worship, it always begins with Om. Japa always includes Om. The Yoga Sutras, 
clearly say tasya vachaka pranavah the name of god is om um it is outside hinduism in buddhism especially tibetan buddhism om is very important in jainism om is very important in sikhism the name of the ultimate reality is om ik onkar in sikhism they say that there's one om which is the ultimate reality so it's it's all pervasive throughout uh, ancient indian culture or even uh, modern indian culture now i said there are three levels at which we can understand om first level primary second which is deeper and very profound and third which is really really profound and stunning actually but a little difficult to understand so all three we will quickly run through before we go to the mantras themselves remember up to mantra 7 from mantra 3 to mantra 1 and 2 introduces om inquiry and inquiry into the self and then mantra 3 4 5 6 7 whatever we have been doing now is the inquiry into the self the four aspects of the self and from mantra 8 to the end which is only mantra 12 8 9 10 11 12 it is inquiry into om so we will take a look at that but i'll give you the essence now the first level of understanding is om is a pratika a symbol um you take om om uh, in the first mantra we saw om is everything whatever is in the past present and future that is om and what is beyond time that is om how you don't have to bother just take it as a symbol so hindus are very big on symbols as you can see so <laughs> all of them are different manifestations of one ultimate divine reality in different ways one manifests the divine reality in the form of knowledge saraswati one in the form of prosperity lakshmi and so on um some are with form some are formless and so on the highest symbol is om so the first way of understanding um om is to take it as a symbol for the ultimate reality symbol for brahman for the entire universe and brahman om is the symbol the pratika pratika means symbol what do you do with it you people worship it as the representative of the ultimate reality when you worship om you are actually worshiping god people use it as because it is sound people use it as a mantra uh, to repeat one of the best ways of calming our mind is to um, panchadashi says dirgha pranav uchcharana the prolonged repetition of om or repetition of the prolonged om when you chant the om stretched out that is a very powerful way of calming the mind om is taken as the name of god as i said it is attached to every mantra so that is one way of understanding om that is the first preliminary and it's not a small thing and uh, that's how it is used in almost every aspect of hinduism for example as a pratika deeper meaning second level the second level is om the mantra is composed of three sounds or three letters om is composed of three letters if you analyze it it yields up three letters what are the three letters a u and m ma or m a u ma actually if you pronounce om you go through the entirety of all sounds because it starts with an open mouth a uh, and then you slowly close the mouth u and then the, all the lips are closed m mm, om now all our sounds are produced in this way from the open mouth to the closed lips and everything in between the different sounds come in between So om is the entire range of human sound pro- producing capacity the entire range of language is included in om uh all of all names all words which signify objects in the world all words are included in om because out of these sounds all the words are made let me repeat from a to from a to m mm, all sounds are included and with these sounds words are made and with these words you refer to reality language refers to reality 
So in that sense, Om includes all reference to reality, all language, and therefore it refers to all of reality. But more specifically, if you look closely at Om, three Part, three central sounds are there. A, U, and M. And after that, there is a silence. Om. The silence is also important. So now you have three letters. A, U, M. And a silence. And we just saw the analysis of the self. Waking, dreaming, deep sleep, and pure consciousness. Does it give you ideas? Four letters or four aspects of Om and four aspects of the self. You think, um, can we match them? Yes, you can. That's what the <laughs> Upanishad does. The Upanishad says, notice, Om has this very important thing which you use for worship. It's so central to your culture. It has four aspects. A, U, M. And silence after that. And the self which we inquired into has four aspects. Waking, dreaming, deep sleep and pure consciousness. Can we match them? Yes, we can. The Upanishad will say now, match A or A, A, the first sound, A to the waking. What do you mean match? Let in our minds, let associate the two. Let the entire waking experience, this waking world and I, the knower, the waker, I, the waker, and my entire waking life, give it a name. What is the name? Ah. Ah. And when I fall asleep and I'm only in my mind and I dream dreams, give it a name. Ooh. Ooh. And when I'm in deep sleep, no ex bl that blankness, no particular experience, no differentiation of knower and known, give it a name, mm, or m. And the reality with the seventh mantra we talked about, neither the waker, nor the dreamer, nor the deep sleeper, nothing in between, uh, um, not the omniscient awareness of God, not unconsciousness, uh, not an object of the senses, and so on and so forth. The seventh mantra which we saw yesterday, the real self, let silence stand for it. Give it a name. The silence after Om stands for it. Silence is very important. I think I mentioned the scholar whom I met at Harvard who is doing a PhD on silence. She's going to write a big thesis on silence. And uh, he was talking about a very important thesis on silence in Buddhism, in Chinese Buddhism. It is called the Vimalakirti Nirdesha Sutra. This is a Sanskrit name. Um, where the story is that the great bodhisattvas, I think 23 bodhisattvas gather. And each of them talks about their enlightenment. What have you realized? What is your realization of, the, of uh, bodhi or enlightenment? Each of them talk, gives his, his or her experience. And the greatest of them, Manjushri. Manjushri comes and says that the highest expression of enlightenment is silence. And then finally it is Vimalakirti's turn to say something, to talk about enlightenment, and he keeps silent. <laughs> so it's almost like a rebuke to Manjushri. So the highest expression is silence, but you spoke. The highest expression is silence, Vimalakirti keeps quiet. So silence is uh, the expression, or, or the best possible, closest expression to the highest truth. And that's what the Mandukya says. But remember, silence by itself will not work. It's only when the 23 bodhisattvas have spoken and given various aspects of enlightenment, and then you keep silent, then it makes sense. If it just had begun with silence, there would be nothing there anyway, and nobody would be any, any wiser. Um, the scholar talked about a composition in Western classical music, recent composition, it's called 4 minutes and 33 seconds. I think uh, a great composer, yes, uh, he composed this. And what you do is, when you go to that concert, you sit for 4 minutes and 33 seconds in silence, and that's the composition. You might think that's silly. No. If you have the entire background of Western classical music, in that, with that background, the silence makes sense. It's a kind of work of art. 
just if you keep silent it's not music so similarly after you have understood what is the waking experience the deep sleep ex- dream experience and the deep sleep experience after that one is in the position to understand the non objective pure consciousness after you have chanted om then the silence after that is significant so the silence stands for pure consciousness and when we um chant om and meditate upon om and by the way when i said om is a u ma don't pronounce it some people do that so don't pronounce it as aum from now on i thought it was om but the swami taught us it is aum from now i'm going to pronounce it aum don't that's wrong sometimes little knowledge is a dangerous thing you're pronouncing it correct it's by a happy coincidence the english o and m om is a precise pronunciation of the sanskrit om what happens is in sanskrit grammar when you put an a and an u next to it it joins and it becomes o so when you pronounce it together a u m it becomes om not aum so om is the correct pronunciation so now we have got this what do you do with it notice now the entire teaching which we went through in the last few days it's all condensed into om when you are chanting om with meaning waking dreaming deep sleep and i as the witness of all of these in me they arise in me they play around and into me they disappear i am the unchanged witness the pure consciousness the fourth with this meaning when you chant om all of what we discussed in the last few classes all of it is condensed into each repetition of om that's what it stands for om stands for everything that we discussed till yesterday in the evening now what will happen is so when you chant om you are actually pointing you're talking about the waking universe deep dream universe deep sleep universe and the witness consciousness beyond them all it's actually a practice of what we have learned it's a dwelling upon of what we have learned sort of centering yourself in what we have learned now when we go into the mantras this will be the second aspect which they will talk about there is a third aspect i mean there is a third level at which we can understand first level of understanding om pratika the symbol just take it as representing ultimate reality second level if you are interested how does it represent ultimate reality it's just a sound aum a o m a om how is it the ultimate reality well then the second level is a is waking u is dream m is deep sleep and silence stands for the fourth and that is how it represents the ultimate reality so that's the second level of understanding third level as promised the difficult stuff but very interesting it's not all that difficult but it's uh, it's so shocking <laughs> uh notice one thing the upanishad does not say om is a symbol of the ultimate reality it does not say om stands for the ultimate reality it says om is the ultimate reality om is brahman a uh, is the waking u is the dream m mm, is the deep sleep and the silence is the ultimate reality not a symbol not stands for it is the reality but how how can a sound be a reality i say paper and here is the reality the object is paper and what i'm saying is a word how can the word be the object it's not they're two different things you can use it in different languages different sounds will be used to represent the same thing how can a sound represent any object let alone the entire universe and the ultimate reality here's how <laughs> for this we have to back up a little and take a look at uh, some advaita philosophy let's bring back our old friend the pot words refer to things words refer to things so word is meaningful if there is something for it to refer to so when i use the word paper it refers to this when i use the word cloth it refers to this when i use the word om it must refer to something 
Now, when we consider the pot, there is the word pot and there is the thing itself. But when we look at it, we are told that yes, it's a pot, but it is made of clay. Clay is the material cause of the pot. So you're all right, very good. Where is this clay? Look at what you're holding. What you're touching is clay. Uh, the top of the pot is clay. The bottom of the pot is clay. Look inside the pot, it's clay. In fact, every bit of the pot is clay. Follow this step by step. Every bit of the pot is clay. Every, every bit of it. We go, yeah, If you, now that you point it out, that's true. All of it is clay. Ah, but if all of it is clay, where is the pot? We have two words now, clay and pot. Now one word, clay, refers to everything there. And pot, the word pot, what does it refer to? Remember, a word must refer to something. Otherwise, it's not meaningful. Word must mean something, some object. What is it pointing to? What reality is the word pot pointing to? You say that thing, but that thing is clay. It's both clay and pot. No. How can it be both clay and pot? Which one is it? So we say, ah, you are tricking me. Pot is a name which refers to the shape and the use to which that pot is put and that, you know, that clay pot is put. So it's a clay pot. The clay is the material and pot is the name uh, for the form of it and the use for it. I can see some people nodding. Yeah, that's right. That's the solution. No, you're wrong again. You say, why? It's obviously a shape and a, a use. In Sanskrit, rupa and vyavahara. Transaction and the shape of the, of the pot. Because, why is it wrong? Because, can the shape exist without the clay? Can the shape of the pot exist without the clay? If you take the clay away, will the shape remain hanging in a ghostly way? In the if you take the water out of the waves, out there in the ocean, how much of the waves will remain? A little bit? Nothing will remain. It will entirely disappear. The form has no existence apart from the substance. Uh, and without the substance, we cannot have any use also. You can't keep water. If you take the clay away from the pot, nothing remains. Now you can't keep water in that nothing. Nothing. It, you can, it won't work. So neither form nor use have any kind of existence apart from the substance. Are you with me on this? So Vedanta is very logical. The, when you mean reality, you mean reality. The reality is the substance itself. On top of that, you have a form and a use. That's fine. But it entirely depends on the substance. The reality is only the substance. Only clay refers to that reality. Pot does not refer to a reality. Even if you say pot refers to a shape and a use, that's not the reality because it's dependent on the clay. So pot does not refer to an object. Pot does not refer to any real entity. Pot is a name without anything which it refers to. If you take the clay away. You see, at least the clay is real. No, the clay is nothing but the earth element. And according to Vedantic cosmology, and the earth element is nothing but the water, water element nothing but fire and air and space, ultimately going back to the Atman, pure being. All right. So the word pot is now just a word without any substance behind it. It just hangs there without, without any reality because clay is the reality, not the word pot. Pot does not refer to a reality. All right, that's about a clay pot. Well, coming back to Om, what good does it do us? Remember when I said Om is a -u -ma. A refers to the waking reality, U refers to the dream reality, and M refers to the deep sleep. But we realized Waking, dreaming, deep sleep are not realities in themselves. The reality is the fourth, the Atman, pure consciousness, which with names and forms appears as the waking, experienced through senses. These are all, even senses are name and form. And in the, it, with name and form appears as the dreaming in a subtle level. And in the potential form, it all sort of crunches back to the blankness of deep sleep. They are not realities in themselves. 
The reality is the fourth pure consciousness. The bracelet and the tiara and the necklace are not realities in themselves. The reality is gold, yes. So gold is the reality. Bracelet, tiara and necklace are names. It's a kind of verbal magic that you're doing. <laughs> it does not refer to any reality apart from gold. And the forms in which we, the necklace ornaments are made, they are all dependent on the gold. Similarly, every form in this world, in the waking world, in the dream world, all of it depends on pure consciousness, the fourth. If that is so, then just like the pot, everything in this waking world uh, has no existence apart from pure consciousness. Therefore, all the names, man, woman, sky, earth, fire, water, all the names that we use in this world, waking world, they, they are empty. They do not refer to anything because the reality belongs to the fourth, not to this waking world. These names are empty. And what are these names, these empty names? All of them are included in Om because all sounds, they're all sound. Names are all sound. And all the sounds are included in the letters Om because from A to M, all sounds are included there. So the, the letter A, U and M refers to all the names in the uh, waking dream and deep sleep uh, experiences. And those names and those experiences are nothing but name. When I say the pot is nothing but a name pot. What are you holding, Swami? That's clay. Uh, similarly, whatever we are experiencing here is in reality nothing but the, the fourth pure consciousness which you are. Then all the names that we use for, to refer to this reality, they are empty. They don't refer to anything. They are just name. And all of the names can be summarized in Om. All the names that we use for the waking world in this waking experiences are nothing but the sound a, uh. and for dream u, and for deep sleep m. Mm. Uh, so everything is name, and all names are nothing but om. In that sense, om is the entire universe. Wait a minute, Swami. What did you do? Let me quickly run through the <laughs> the chain of logic. Names must, must refer to something. Paper, here. But when we examine this thing itself, pot, referring to, um, to uh, this pot, we, we find that the name pot does not refer to anything. It's clay only. All of it is clay. And if you further inquire into clay, you'll find it does not refer to anything. It is the earth element and so on. So the name becomes empty. It has, it is, the pot is nothing but just a name. Um, the reality is something else, clay. Similarly, all things in this universe, waking, dreaming, and deep sleep, are nothing but names. The reality is the fourth pure consciousness. And therefore, the entire universe, and all names are nothing but Om. So the entire universe is nothing but Om. Waking, dreaming, deep sleep are nothing but Om. I hope you get the trend of what they're trying to say. It's a pretty shocking uh, conclusion <laughs> which they're drawing. It's literally, they mean it literally, uh, that the entire universe is nothing but the sound ohm. And beyond the waking, dreaming, deep sleep is pure consciousness, which we are, the fourth. How does ohm represent that? When you chant ohm, at the end of ohm, there is a silence. Ohm. That silence... Don't take the silence, the physical silence, as the silence. That silence appears to you, the consciousness. So the silence points to you, the consciousness, which illumines the silence. You, the awareness, which shines in the silence. The Buddhist phrase is beautiful, clear light of the void. The silence is the void, and you are the clear light. So the silence refers to you, the pure consciousness. Uh, and in the uh, first, in the second interpretation, but in the third interpretation, the silence is you, the pure consciousness. It's the clear light of the void. So the silence after Om is literally pure consciousness or Brahman. Not the physical silence, but the consciousness which pervades that physical silence. 
summing up a u ma stand for waking dreaming deep sleep but truly speaking all the objects in waking dreaming deep sleep are nothing but pure consciousness in themselves they are only names all names are in are just sounds and all sounds are included within om a u and ma so om stands for the entire manifested universe waking dreaming deep sleep and the silence after om refers or is actually the pure consciousness which pervades that silence so the silence is is uh, brahman or uh, uh, the self which is brahman is also that silence uh, the upanishad talks about i am atma brahma this very self is brahman okay i'll leave it at that it just has to be repeated until it sinks in now let's quickly take a look at the mantras eight onwards we come to mantra number 8 uh, can we go forward mantra number 8 yeah what's going to go on what's going to happen now you're going to relate you'll see you'll, you will easily understand it will relate a u ma with waking dreaming deep sleep and silence with the pure consciousness that's what's going to happen now the way it is presented is it will tell you what to relate to what why you should relate it and a reason will be given don't worry about it the reasoning will not convince you it's it's a, it's a very ancient and different way of thinking remember it is thousands of years ago and a result will be given if you meditate on om in this way then you will get this result it's it's a stylistic way of presenting it so what will you see three things you will see what is to be related to what a uh, to waking u to dream m mm, to deep sleep and silence to pure consciousness that's one second why why is a uh, the name of waking why is u the name of dreaming why they will tell you give you a reason or two two reasons and then a result will be promised if you meditate in this way you will get this result mantra 8 soyam atma adhyaksharam onkaram adhimatram padamatram matrascha padam akar ukara makara iti soyam atma that very self which self which we discussed last few days that very self adhyaksharam if you look at it in terms of letters what does it become omkar it becomes omkar omkar means om the the mantra om that mantra om how is it um, the self this is pada matra matra ascha pada the four aspects of the self related to the four aspects of or the four letters of om the first three aspects waking dreaming deep sleep and pure consciousness the fourth related to a u ma and silence so akara ukara makara iti a u and ma akara ukara makara means a u ma in english translation a u u and m so it's not the english a it it's a and u of course is the uh, u and and when it says m it means m first uh, mantra number 9 mantra number 9 waking state jagaritasthano vaishvanara akara prathama matra akara prathama matra apte radimatvad apnoti havai sarvan निहवै सर्वान कामान आदिश्च भवति यएवं वेद द वेकिंग स्टेट जागृत स्थान द वेकिंग स्टेट वैश्वानर वैश्वानर इज द कॉस्मिक फॉर्म इन द वेकिंग स्टेट रिमेंबर वी टॉक्ड अबाउट वन अवेयरनेस बीइंग एसोसिएटेड विद द एंटायर फिजिकल यूनिवर्स दैट वन he says please associate it with the first letter what is the first letter a uh, give it the name a uh. and why should you do it because it is the first 
A uh, is the first letter of Om, and the waking state is where we begin, so we take uh, the, the waking state to be the first, and so because they are the first, you associate them. And, um, um, and if you meditate on Om as this, the entirety of the waking world, what will happen, you are, the prize they promise you is, you will attain the, uh, the fulfillment of all desires, uh, the one who meditates in this way. So that's the result promised. One thing is, don't meditate. When you chant Om, the Swami promised us that I will fulfill all my desires if I associate A uh, with the waking state. And so I'm, I'm doing this meditation. Ah, uh, don't do that. Whenever you do these meditations, it is with the entire Om. So chant Om or mentally repeat Om, but meditate on that fact that the first letter of Om uh, stands for the entire universe, waking universe. That's the way to do this meditation. One who knows means one who meditates in this way attains the fulfillment of all desires. The tenth mantra. The tenth mantra is dream state. Swapnasthana Taijasa Ukaro Dvitiya Matra Utkarshad Ubhayatwad Utkarshati Havai Jnana Santatim Samanascha Bhavati Nasya Brahmavet Kule Bhavati Yaevam Veda The second letter U Please associate it with the dream state, taijasa, the dreamer, and the dream experience. That means the, all this, the subtle state of the mind. All of that stands for U. Um, U stands for all of that. Why? Because we sort of take it as in between. Um, waking and deep sleep in between is the dream state. And U is in between A uh and M. Um. That's why you should associate U with the dream state. Not unreasonable. And what happens if you do that? If you meditate on U as the dream state, the entirety of the dream universe, the subtle universe, Utkarshad, you excel in knowledge. And not only that, there is no one who is not a knower of Brahman in your lineage. So if you meditate on Om as U, the entire subtle universe, or in a less ambitious way, it is uh, said that in your lineage, there will never be a lack of knowers of Brahman. There will be some people who will always be enlightened in your lineage. So that's the result which is promised. Don't be distracted by these results. The point is to be attain enlightenment, to realize that I am the pure consciousness. But this is just the way it is presented. Mantra 11. Sushupta sthanam Pragyam Makara stritiya matra Makar stritiya matra miter apiterva minoti havaidam sarvam apitishya bhavati yaivam veda and the third deep sleep please associate it with the end of om mm, that one um and meditate on that. When you meditate on Om as the absolute stillness and quietness of deep sleep. Why would you associate M mm with uh, deep sleep? Um, the logic, I don't know if I have, yeah, a little bit of time. The logic here is a little convoluted. Not that it matters, but it's interesting. What it says here is, because it is the measure of all. What is the measure of all? Deep sleep, we have to understand why it's a, what is a measure, what does it mean by measure, and why is deep sleep a measure of everything. Think of deep sleep in this way. Deep sleep, from my personal experience, is where all the waking experience disappears, where all my dreams disappear into darkness. That's deep sleep. And they all pop out of that. When I wake up or when I start dreaming again, everything emerges from that deep sleep. So imagine like a big barrel, or like a barrel, everything is poured into it, waking and dreaming, and you, 
nothing, blank, deep sleep. And everything is poured out of it when you wake up or you start dreaming. If you can imagine that, now. You have to go back to ancient, not even ancient, India, even in modern India in the villages. When you go to a shop, the local grocer in a shop, and you want some rice. In modern India and in America, you go to supermarkets and you buy, buy, buy the packet of rice. But if you go to a shopkeeper in a village, even till today, what that guy will do is ask you how much you want, and then he will he has a store of rice there. He has a big measuring cup. So he pours that rice into the measuring cup. So it disappears into the measuring cup. And when it's full, he pours it out again into your bag. That's how he measures it. That cup is the measure. The notice what happens to the rice. It disappears into it and it pours out of it. And that's the example he's using here. So you have to know all of this to make sense of it. Imagine deep sleep to be like that measuring cup. Waking and dreaming disappear into it and are poured out of it. When you go to sleep, waking and dreaming disappear into it. And when you wake up, waking and dreaming seem to come out of deep sleep. And you see how it makes sense psychologically. So he says, because deep sleep is the measure of all things. Measure in that sense. How is Om the last M mm, the measure? When, when you close your lips, all sounds disappear into it. That's the end. And you open your lips, all sounds emerge from it. So that is the measure. It's like the measuring cup where all sounds disappear and emerge from that. So I don't know if it makes any sense to you. It makes some kind of sense. So that's why the last one, mm, should be associated with deep sleep. And the one who meditates in this way, um, that person comprehends everything within, like, a, like that measuring cup, everything is comprehended within oneself. That's the result promised. All right. Now the 12th mantra, the end of all of this. The 12th mantra. Amatras Chatutta Abhyavaharya Prapancho Pashama Shiva Dvaita Evam Onkara Atmeva Samvishati Atmanatmanam Yaivam Veda. A very beautiful mantra. It says, Amatra, the silence. After Om, Om. The silence, it stands for the fourth, pure consciousness. And that silence is Advyavaharya, beyond transaction, beyond usage. So when you speak, that is use of language. When you're silent, that is beyond the use of language. Like pure consciousness in itself, it is beyond any transactions. But when it's involved, when it shines through the body and mind, all transactions are possible. What do I mean by transactions? Thinking, willing, loving, hating, um, perceiving, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, talking, walking, all transactions are possible to you, the consciousness, through the body and mind. But in itself, it does not do anything. Similarly, silence does not do anything. Abhyavaharya. Prapancha upashama. It is, notice it's using the same words which it used for uh, the pure consciousness. Prapancha upashama means silence of the universe. So here in the silence after Om is the silence of the universe. Prapancha upashama. Uh, it is the end of all sorrows. Prapancha upashama is the end of all sorrows, the cessation of sorrows. Um, silence is the cessation of all trouble. I remember we, we had this Swami who was very quiet. He didn't speak much. And the problem was he was the head of a center. So people needed to speak to him, but he wouldn't speak. He would say one or two words. So one day somebody asked him, Swami, why don't you speak? And the Swami said, you see, now there is only one complaint against me that I don't speak. <laughs> if I spoke, and he left it at that, <laughs> there would be a variety of complaints. You know, he didn't say that. He just said, if I spoke, and that's it. So silence is the end of all trouble. And it is Shiva. It is auspicious. It is non-dual. 
because all sounds emerge from it and disappear back into it. All the sounds are non-different from that silence. Understand here, there are two kinds of silence. One silence is the opposite of noise. So I'm speaking, this is not silence. Now I stop speaking, that was silence. So this is the opposite of sound. But there is a deeper silence which underlies sound and its absence. I remember I was in an ashram in the Himalayas. It's very, very silent there, very deep silent. And it's a kind of very profound silence which seeps into you, which goes deep into, into your being. And there's a bird in that place. That place is not actually unknown to most people. If you have read the tiger hunting stories of Jim Corbett, um, that's, where it, it, uh, that's where the ashram is, where those tigers were there at one time. Um, and there's a bird called the bell bird. It just goes ding dong, and it's, it's miles away in a valley. And at night you can just hear that ding dong, and it's so silent everywhere. So deep silence. But the interesting thing is, after I left that ashram and came down to the plains of India, which as you know are very noisy, and I was in one of the noisiest cities, in the noisiest part of that city, Lucknow, and in a rickshaw, going on the street, a lot of sound. And suddenly, I felt the deep silence there too. It was a very interesting, unforgettable experience. And every hair on the hand stood on its end. You felt that underneath this, all this bustle and dirt and noise and movement, the deep silence of that valley where the ashram is. So it sort of seeps into your very bones as it were. That silence underlies the presence of noise when you are talking, hearing, music, noise, things are going on, that silence is still there. And when there is nothing, quietness, that silence is still there. That silence stands for pure consciousness. So here he says, that silence, evam omkara, in this way, om, atmeva, is the self, is the very self. The one who knows this, ya evam veda, the one who meditates on om in this way, Samvishati atmana atmanam. The self is merged in the self. You merge this self. Self means this waking self. I, this person, I realize I am that pure consciousness. Merging does not actually mean something will be merged in another thing. Often this language is used and it can be misleading. It's like sometimes they say pouring water in water, uh, merging the self in the higher self. Actually one thing is being merged in another thing. Not so. You just realize that that's always been there. I am always that. It's not that I am now, how are you doing? I'm 50% merged with 50% remaining. I hope if I come back for one more um, course, then I think I can go up to 80% merger. No, you are that already. And that's what we realize. The self is merged in the self. Samvishati atmana atmanam yaevam veda. And so, and after this, there are some very beautiful karikas, which I'll leave as homework. You can take a look. So this is the first chapter of the Mandukya Karika. This is the entire Upanishad. We have happily been able to go through the mantras of the Upanishad, the 12 mantras, the shortest and most powerful of the Upanishads. But the karikas themselves are very profound. They are there for further reading. First chapter is what we looked at, uh, some of the karikas. And then second chapter is only the karikas, third chapter is only the karikas, and fourth chapter is only the karikas. What happens there? Just one line. Um, in the second chapter, what Gaudapada wants to do is, he takes up this word, prapanchopashama, silence of the universe, and tries to prove that logically. How do you say that this universe, which seems so real, how are you saying it's an appearance? How do you say it's not, uh, it's not a substantial reality? He uses logic to prove that. Wonderful chapter, second chapter, that is called Vaitathya Prakaranam, the chapter on falsity. Not that the chapter is false, the chapter on falsity, falsity of the universe or silence of the universe. The third chapter is on non-duality, Advaitam. He uses logic to prove that you, the self, pure consciousness, you are non-dual. Non-dual means there's no second thing apart from you. Whatever appears to be apart from you, people and objects and events, they are nothing but you appearing in that way, God pretending to be not God. But can you prove it logically? It sounds cool, but can you prove it logically? I remember 
So at Harvard, you have to write papers. It's, it's really interesting at this age, again, back to assignments and stuff. So I was writing this paper for um, Tibetan Buddhism course. And the professor made me do it three times. Uh, once, corrected, and then said, do it again. And he said, what do you think this is? A temple talk? This is a Harvard University philosophy paper. So you have to give arguments. You, can, you just can't say it is not dual. What do you mean non-dual and how? Give arguments for and against. So that's what Gaurapada does in the third chapter, Advaita Prakaranam, chapter on non-duality. Very beautiful, very powerful again. And quite disturbing when you begin to see, actually not disturbing, very inspiring, when you begin to see the oneness of all existence. And the fourth chapter is called Alata Shanti Prakaranam, the chapter on the quenching of the fire brand. There's a meaning to that. It's a discussion of many other philosophical views. It's sort of a chapter is a sort of a miscellany. So four chapters. The first one is called uh, Agama Prakarana, the chapter on the Upanishad, where the Upanishad is. Second one, Vaitatya Prakaranam, chapter on falsity of the universe. Third one, Advaita Prakaranam, chapter on non-duality. Non-duality of what? Your non-duality, non-duality of the self. And the fourth one, Alata Shanti Prakaranam, chapter on the quenching of the firebrand. Those who know Buddhism, they know it's a, a motif used in Buddhism, the whirling firebrand. You know, if you take a little bit of a coal, uh, of, of a little bit of fire and you whirl it around, it looks like, not like a point, but like a circle. Anyway, so that's the Mandukya Karika. Uh, please do read it at your leisure. Uh, it's, it really, it, uh, it is worthwhile. It's one of the most profound depths and heights of human thought that civilization has ever reached. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ramakrishna